So in this video, we're going to talk about simple rational functions. The reciprocal function is f of x equals k over x, where k is a constant. So this is the most basic rational function. That's the parent function for all the other rational functions. It's when the numerator is just 1 and the denominator is just x. Of course, the numerator could be any other constant. Um, as long as it's over x, we would call it a reciprocal function. And then we're going to learn about more complex ones where there's actually a much more complicated expression on the top and the bottom. But x being on the bottom is what makes this rational. 1 over x is the parent function called the reciprocal function. The graph of a reciprocal function is called a hyperbola, and you can see the shape of it on this graph. As it says in the notes here, hyperbolas have two branches, so the blue is the actual function. The red dotted lines are called asymptotes, and we'll dive into those a little bit more later. Um, also noted here is that a hyperbola has two lines of symmetry, y equals x and y equals negative x. That would be this line of symmetry, right? Because if you folded it over on itself, that would match up on either side of that purple line. This is also a line of symmetry for this function, uh, because if you folded it over on itself over that purple line, it would also line up with itself. I can delete those purple lines. They're not actually part of the function. It's just to illustrate symmetry. The domain of a, of a uh, hyperbola is that x can be all real numbers. So if you look at this thing from left to right, x is all the real numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity except for 0. So at 0, there is an asymptote. The function cannot exist there. So the domain is everything except for 0. And the range if you look from, from bottom to top, uh, is also all real numbers because y goes from negative infinity up to positive infinity. However, also cannot include 0. There is a uh, horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And if you look at the function, it should make sense why, looking at this function right here, x cannot be 0, right, because it's in the denominator of a fraction. And also y cannot be 0 because if you do 1 divided by a number, you'll never get 0 as the y value. So those are the two restrictions on your most basic hyperbola. The graph of any reciprocal function of the form y equals k over x, here's the note about asymptotes, as I promised it was coming, has a vertical asymptote at x equals 0 and a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So there you can see how the word asymptote is spelled. Remember the difference between a vertical line and a horizontal line. For a vertical line, it's going to have an equation like x equals 0, and a horizontal line is going to have an equation like y equals 0. And it should make sense why, if this is your function, right, this can never be 0 because it's on the denominator of a fraction. And where's y in this equation? Over here. And this will never be 0. Because how can you do a number divided by x and get 0? Uh, this just asks you to investigate how the numerator actually does change the shape of the graph because 1 over x is the parent function, but what if you were to make it 2 over x or 3 over x? So I did graph these three functions on the same set of axes over here on Desmos. So you can see the red is 1 over x, the blue is 2 over x, and the green is 3 over x. It's basically just affecting the steepness of the function and how close it comes to the origin. And the next slide asks us to investigate how does changing the sign of the numerator affect the graph? So what if we were to make each of those functions have a negative numerator instead? Well, you could see what it's done to the red is it's switched the location of the branches because what's actually happened is it's like a negative a value which causes a reflection over the x-axis. So every positive y value became negative and every negative y value became positive. So the whole function flips over the x-axis when you make the numerator negative. Because it's been a while since we've done an inverse, let's go ahead and find the inverse of the reciprocal function. So to find an inverse, remember that f of x just means y, and then switch x and y, because in inverse functions you have to switch the x and the y. Now this is the inverse function, however it's not in function form, so I'm going to isolate the new y. In order to isolate this y, I have to multiply both sides by y. That will make it cancel out from here. And over here I'll have y times x equals 1. And then to solve for y, I have to divide both sides by x. So it ends up being that the inverse function is also 1 over x. Sort of an unexpected result. And the note here at the bottom says the reciprocal function is a self-inverse function. 
It's one of a uh, few functions that, that does that, right? The inverse is itself. Now to graph transformations of A over X, it should be pretty um, familiar, the H and the K notation. The center of the hyperbola used to be at zero, zero, right? If we go back a few slides, you'll see that where the asymptotes cross is sort of the center. And it's at zero, zero for the parent function one over X. If I start adding or subtracting things to this, just like we're used to, it's going to shift the graph left and right and up and down. So H values are going to shift this thing side to side in the opposite direction from what you would expect based on the sign. And the K is going to shift this thing up and down and all the other points just follow with it. So you're sort of shifting the center of the asymptotes where the asymptotes intersect and then drawing the branches as you would otherwise. Notice that H is in the denominator of the fraction. K is outside next to the fraction. And A here is just a constant, some number like two or negative three. So here's an example of one that's all filled in. It's asking us to graph it and then state the domain and range. So to get the basic graph of this, we want to figure out where the asymptotes are going to intersect first. So normally the asymptotes intersect at 0, 0. And so here, because we have an H value and a K value, we're shifting this thing to the left 2 because we go the opposite direction from H and down 1 because the K value is minus 1. So if I shift this um, center to the left 2 and down 1, I'm going to get an asymptote here at negative 2 and an asymptote at negative 1. And so the asymptotes that used to cross at 0, 0 are now crossing at negative 2, negative 1. And then to figure out the rest of the shape, that's going to depend on what that A value is. I'm going to just plug in a few things to the left and to the right of this vertical asymptote, so a few things to either side of center, and figure out where the branches end up being. So I'm going to basically evaluate um, Let's see, if negative 2 is the asymptote, I'll evaluate f of negative 3 and figure out what's happening on the left. We get negative 4 divided by negative 3 plus 2. I'm plugging in negative 3 to the function where I see x just to determine more or less where that number should be. I get 3. And so that means there's a coordinate over here at negative 3, positive 3 on this function. So I'm going to end up with a function that looks something like this. I could have expected that the branch was going to be up in this corner because I noticed that the a value is negative, and so it has that reflection thing going on. I'm also going to make x be um, 0. I just want to see what the right side of this graph should look like, more or less. I have 0 plus 2, and negative 4 divided by 2 is negative 2. So here I have a number at negative 3 and so on. So I've got my uh, general sketch of this function. Now the stating the domain and range, it follows a formula, very simple for these. The domain is going to be all real numbers except for the place that x cannot exist. So if you look at where the x values are restricted, it's at this negative 2 value, so x cannot equal negative 2. Or you can look to the denominator of the fraction and see what is x not allowed to be. For the range, it's going to be all real numbers, except for, and then we want to look at what is the y restriction, and that's cannot equal negative 1. And you can just get those from looking at h and k as well. For finding intercepts, it's important to remember, this is review, but to find a y-intercept, you change x to 0, and to find an x-intercept, you change y to 0. Um, the x-intercepts are also called the zeros of the function, so that might be worth noting. We want to sort of see this in action in order to know what sort of algebra is involved in solving these. So let's see if I have an example on the next slide. All right, so this example says try to find the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. It actually just says the intercepts. For f of x equals 2 over x, dot, 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 can you? So let's try to find the y-intercept and the x-intercept. Different process for each one of these. So if I make x be 0, I'm finding the y-intercept. And we see that it's just 2 over 0, which is undefined. This function has no y-intercept. For an x-intercept, I'm supposed to change y to 0. In order to solve this equation, I would multiply both sides by x. x times 0 is just 0. And that's not true, right? This thing over here is false. And when you get an equation like that where x drops out and your statement left is false, that also has no solution, so there's no x-intercept either. Now that should make sense because from this function we know it has an asymptote at 0, 0. So how could I make 
x be 0 or y be 0 on this function. I'm going to be located there when x is 0 and y is 0. And that's not um, defined for this function. So if it's just a basic reciprocal function, it doesn't have an x and a y-intercept. It never crosses the x or y axis. But as soon as there are some transformations, like in this function that has h and k in it, um, it might cross the axes. So we have to figure out what algebra is involved in solving these. So x-intercept, or y-intercept and x-intercept. For y-intercept, I'm going to change x to 0. This is usually the easier one, which is why I do it first. Simplify the denominator. I get 2 over negative 1. 2 over negative 1 is negative 2, and negative 2 minus 4 is negative 6. So that means I have a point at 0, negative 6 on this function. That's the y-intercept. And for an x-intercept, I'm supposed to change y to 0. Now, there is no y in this function. It's f of x, but I'm changing that to 0. And then I'm going to solve this. Now, the algebra involved in solving this, I'm going to add this 4 first because I can. It's simple to do. 0 plus 4 is 4. And once I have something set up like this, if 4 equals 2 over x minus 1, we can multiply both sides by this x minus 1, which will get rid of the denominator from the right side of the equation. Bye bye, denominator. And in the left side, we will have to distribute. So 4x minus 4 equals 2. Add 4 4x equals 6, and divide, and x equals 3 over 2. And that means there's a point on this function at 3 halves, comma, 0, and that's the x-intercept for this function. And that is all.